Fortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and so on. But what is evil concupiscence? That's what we are going to look at today. Now I should proceed to some application of this point, but because there is a third particular which has much affinity with the two former, namely fornication and uncleanness, I will first speak of that which is here in my text, evil concupiscence. By concupiscence men understand a degree of this lust of uncleanness, and it is an evil inclination and the power of the soul. The doctrine is this, evil concupiscence is one of the sins which are likewise to be mortified. We have to give a reason for it, because men will hardly be persuaded that it is a sin. So it is with the heathen, they thought there was no sin in it. The first reason is, if concupiscence does cleave to a man, that is evil inclinations which the soul by sin is bent to, then actual sin will follow which is the fruit of this concupiscence. It is as a spark of fire, which being let alone will grow greater and greater, and like a leaven, though little at the first, yet does it leaven the whole lump, so that it does produce the works of the flesh, and therefore it is to be mortified. The second reason is, although a man does not fall into actual sin presently after there is a concupiscence in the heart, Yet being unmortified, it hides a sin in a man, and so defiles him, and makes him prone to an evil disposition, and also to be abominable before God. Therefore mortify concupiscence before it come to have a vigor and strength in you. A man is said to be an evil man when he is distracted from good to evil. Now evil concupiscence makes a man to be so. There are evil inclinations in a good man, and yet it is by way of antithesis. It is not his complexion and constitution to have them. Now an evil man has concupiscence, and the same is his complexion and constitution so to be. Therefore, if evil concupiscence be not mortified, it makes a man to be bad. And in this regard, we ought to cleanse ourselves from the pollution of this sin. The third reason is, evil concupiscence being in a man, it mars all his good actions. To mingle water with wine, it makes the wine the worse. To mingle dross with silver, it makes the silver the more impure. So evil concupiscence being in the soul of a man, it does stain and blemish his good actions. When the string of an instrument is out of tune, the music doth jar. A man that has strong concupiscence in him, he will desire to come to the execution of the works of them, and so it will have an influence to the effect, and will stain and blemish any good work he goes about. So that evil concupiscence, making a man to be evil, it blemishes and stains all the good actions that a man goes about, and that he does perform them either with vainglory or self-respect. The fourth reason why evil concupiscence should be mortified is because that otherwise the commandments of God will be grievous to us. 1 John 5, 3 For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. The commandments of God are not only to be kept of us, but so to be kept that they may be delightful to us. Psalm 103, verse 1 Bless the Lord! O oh, my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. When concupiscence dwells in the soul of a man, in its full vigor and strength, unmortified, it draws in him a reluctance from good duties, as when a man does will one thing that is good, and an evil inclination does set upon him, then the commandments of God will be grievous to him, even as a man will be unwilling to carry a burden long. Now I proceed to show you these things observable in this word concupiscence. First, what the nature of it is. Secondly, the sinfulness of it. Thirdly, the operation or works of it. 
First, for the better understanding what it is to know that in the soul of man there is a facility. Secondly, there is an inclination which does adhere to the faculty. And thirdly, there are actual desires which flow from that inclination by way of similitude, the better to conceive. First, in the mouth there is a palate. Secondly, the desired humor. And thirdly, the taste, so in the soul of man. First, there is a natural affection. Secondly, there is an inclination, which is the tunableness or untunableness of it. And thirdly, there is a desire or actual works of it. By concupiscence is meant the evil inclination and the fruits of the evil inclination, and by it the habitual concupiscence. From this, the actual desires of people will follow, Romans 6.12. Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. First, there is a sin. Secondly, the lust of that sin. And thirdly, the obedience, that is, consent to the sin. There is a concupiscence that is natural and another that is moral. As there is a concupiscence that is bad, so there is another that is good, and a third that is neither good nor evil. There was in Christ a desire to live, though it were God's will he should die, yet obeying he did not sin. On fast days we are commanded so to do, yet the desire to taste corporal food on such a day is not sin. Secondly, it proceeds from sin. And one sin doth beget another, James 1.15. Concupiscence brings forth sin. Let not sin reign therefore in your mortal bodies, that is, let not concupiscence. But to understand what the sinfulness of it is, know that sin in special is the transgression of the moral law, any faculty that is capable of a fault. It is sin that is the defect of it. Man should be subject to reason, and reason should cause him to submit himself to the will of God. The moral law is a rule of action, not of habit. There is a double law, a law of action, and a law which we call that law which God did stamp on the very creature. Take an epistle, or a learned writing that is made by art. There may be logic, rhetoric, and grammar rules, brought in to confirm it. So in the law there is a stamp and a rule and every aberration from it is an error in it. If a man did all that is in himself, used his best endeavor to subdue his evil concupiscences and yet cannot, yet it is not sufficient for him, every man has or ought to have strength in him, so to rule his affections. If a master command his servant to go and do such a thing, if the servant go and make himself drunk and then go about it and cannot bring it to pass, although he do his good will for to do it, he is not to be excused because he did lose his ability through his own fault. So we, God at the first, did make us able for to subdue our loss, but we in Adam, having lost the abilities of our first estates, and yet may recover strength again, to subdue our loss in Christ, the second Adam, if we do it not, the fault is in ourselves. Now we proceed to the third particular, to show to you what is the operation and working of this evil concupiscence. It is an inordinate inclination which cleaves to the faculties of the soul and indisposes a man to that which is good and carries him on to that which is evil. And so long as it abides in the soul, it makes him fruitful to do evil and barren to do good. So that evil actions, the fruits of evil inclinations, arise from it, even as water from the fountain and sparks from the fire. Concupiscence conceives and brings forth sin. 
There is a different work of concupiscence in man that is evil, and a regenerate man. In an evil man it has dominion over him, so that all his actions and desires are sinful. In a good and holy man there is concupiscence also, but it works in him by way of rebellion. He beholds it as a disease, and as an enemy unto him, and he labors to mortify it. He is enlightened by grace to see it as a disease, and therefore labors to cure it more and more. An evil man thinks it the best way for his happiness, and that his chief is good, consists in giving satisfaction to his concupiscences, and therefore labors to satisfy them and not to cure them. True it is, God's children, David, Peter, Solomon, and other holy men, have had concupiscences in them, but yet were not domineered over by them. So long as a man strives against evil concupiscences, against emotions and stirrings of them, and that his own conscience can bear him witness, he resists them in sincerity of heart. They shall never bear sway over him. Take the best actions of a wicked man, the utmost end of them are to himself, and if the utmost end be bad, all he does must needs be bad. As for example, the end that a husbandman does aim at in the tilling of the ground and sowing of his seed corn is to have a good harvest, and if his harvest prove bad, then all his labor is lost. Though the beginnings of a thing be good, yet if the utmost end of that thing be nothing, all is bad, so that the end of all things in moral actions makes the thing either good or bad. Every wicked man does seek himself in all his actions. He does worship himself in the utmost end of all his thoughts, so that all his actions, lusts, and desires are evil continually. Now I proceed to show you what it is the Apostle Paul would have you to mortify. Here something is presented. And to show you plainly what it is, it consists in these two particulars. First, the habitual concupiscence, and secondly, the inordinate lusts and desires that arise from it. One we call habitual, and the other actual. Now, the apostle would have the habitual concupiscence in nature weakened, and secondly, he would have the acts of the lust to be suppressed. Now that it is the Apostle's meaning that he would have them mortified, and that which is to be mortified is sin, mark that place I cited before, Romans 6.12, Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. And these words are three things observable. First, there is a sin. Secondly, a lust to sin. And thirdly, obedience to the sin, that is, a will to execute the desire of this lust. When the apostle says he would have them mortified, he would have the heart to be cleansed from the habitual custom of evil concupiscence, and secondly, he would have them to be subdued and not to obey them. That you may know the apostle's meaning, and not to lay a straighter charge upon you than the Holy Ghost doth. He would have all the three to be mortified, the lust, the consent to the lust, and the act of the will. Consider the nature of the things that are to be mortified. If you take the evil inclination and compare it with the strength of the mind in committing of any sin, they are all of the same nature. They differ but in degree. A lesser evil in the thought, before consent unto it, is of the same nature as a greater, as it is in murder. He that is angry with his brother unadvisedly commits a degree of murder. So he that slanders his brother by taking away of his good name commits a degree of murder. And it is a sin of the same nature as if he took away the life of his brother. So as in taking away the comfort of a man's life, it is a degree of murder, inasmuch as that man would take away the life of his brother if he might. So in lust, if a man desired to commit adultery with a woman, and cannot come to the execution of his will 
in it to the committing of the actual sin yet the adultery of the thoughts and affections are degrees to this sin and are of the same nature as if he had committed the sin itself the commandment says he shall not covet your neighbor's wife that is in no degree at all to hurt her or to wrong her if all be of one nature and differ in degree then all are to be mortified the same nature is in one drop of water that it is in a whole sea and the same nature in a spark that there is in a great fire if there be enmity between sin and us we will abstain from all sin a man that hates the very colors of his enemy is toads and snakes that are poison if a man abstains in sincerity from sin he will abstain from all sin the reason why men abstain from any sin is either for love of themselves or of God if for love of yourself you abstain from sin the, you might just as well commit all as some it is for love of God you will abstain from all sins from little sins as well as great sins here a question may be asked why men abstain from murder and idolatry the answer is because God did forbid it and did not God forbid also you shall not lust God that doth forbid the one doth forbid the other and for your further consideration no the Holy Spirit of God hates every sin it doth abandon and hate that heart where the thoughts of lust are nourished now the heart is a habitation and residence of the Holy Ghost therefore all sins are to be mortified that the Holy Ghost may come and dwell there the acts of mortification are chiefly these the Apostle would have us take pains with our hearts men that might do much good to themselves would they but take pains to consider and ponder their ways but when men are carried away with a desire of riches vainglory and other con inconsiderations no marvel if it be thus with them if they would but sit alone meditate and reflect their minds upon what they should do it would be a great means to make them to alter their courses the apostle when he would have them mortify these lusts he would have them consider the means how to suppress them there be strong reasons in the word of God for them let them search the grounds they have for the committing of those laws and it will be an effectual means for the mortifying of them if men's judgments were rectified to see their follies they would change their courses and turn the bent of their affections another way I should deliver many things to you in this kind considering mortification to let it be your care that it may work upon your inward affection that you may make it profitable unto your own souls and that you do not let it pass from you without doing you good the word of God which you hear is not lost it shall certainly do you hurt if not good it shall harden if it do not soften it is an ill sign if a tree does not bud in the spring but to see it without leaves in the winter is no wonder at all so for any to hear the word of God powerfully preached and not to have good wrought on them by it they have great cause to fear their state it is this meditating and taken to heart which is the first means I prescribe for mortification we're said secondly to mortify when we suppress and keep down these lusts if we keep them back from their courses that they do not bring forth the fruit of sin all actions when any sin is executed they tend to evil corruptions if we abstain from the action of sin when it doth kill the very inclination take any sin that a man is naturally inclined to whether it be the sin of uncleanness the desire of riches or whatsoever custom makes his lust to be stronger and so adds to the sin one light does show a thing to be so but more lights makes it appear more clear 
So there is an addition in sin as well as in grace. The more they act in sin, the more they increase. Now when men complain, they know not what to do. They cannot be without their lust. Let them thank themselves for it. In suffering themselves by custom to practice them, but by keeping down the act of sin, the lust will evaporate away in time. Though your lust be strong and violent at the first, yet if you will let it alone from the execution of it, it will consume and wear away at the last. Therefore keep down your lusts and suppress them. Thirdly, to wean these lusts, inordinate affections and concupiscences, the rectifying of the judgment and applying of right means, doth mortify the higher reason. Now for to mortify the lower reason is to turn away the bent of affection on another object. If grace be quick and lively in a man, it turns away the mind from sin. And a way to wean these lusts is to keep the mind fixed and bent on better things as temperance, chastity, and sobriety. For all intemperance breeds lust, and then the devil does take occasion and advantage to work upon a man. But sobriety and temperance is a great means to keep back the, these evil affections. Now I proceed to make use of what has been formally delivered concerning these three sins, fornication, uncleanness, and evil concupiscence. You may remember what has been said concerning the greatness of the sin of uncleanness. It will follow then, if it be so great a sin, we should use the means to be freed from it. Those that are guilty of it, let them give themselves no rest, their eyelids no slumber, nor God any rest, till they be delivered from the band of this iniquity, 1 Samuel 2.25. Remember what Eli said to his sons, If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him, but if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? When God takes in hand to afflict a creature, then it is intolerable. Man shall find it to be a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Take an arrow or a bullet and let it be shot into the body of a man. It may wound deeply and yet be cured again. But let the head of that arrow be poisoned or the bullet envenomed, and then the wound proves deadly and incurable. There may be in the body of a man many great gashes and deep wounds and yet be cured but if the affliction lies on the creature from the wrath of god he is not able to bear it it causes them to tremble and his conscience to be terrified within him as we see by men that are in despair now the reason of it is god when he smites the creature in his wrath wounds his spirit and as it were breaks it in sunder as god does break the spirit so he does sustain the spirit. But when he does withdraw himself from the creature, then the strongholds of the spirit are gone. This is to show you what a terrible thing it is to fall into the hands of the living God. This, as it does belong to all, so especially to those that have received the sacrament this day, or before, that they make conscience of this sin. If they do not, they receive it unworthily, and he that is guilty of this is guilty of the body and blood of Christ. He discerns not the Lord's body, neither does he prize it as he should, nor esteem of the excellency of it as he ought. He discerns not with what reverence he should come to the Lord's table. Therefore, says the apostle, he is guilty of the body and blood of Christ. That is, he is guilty of the same sin that those were that did mock and crucify Christ Jesus. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper is a special means and chief ordinance of God for the attainment of his blessing, if it be rightly received. And so it is the greatest judgment that can befall a man if it be not rightly received, for Christ is chiefly represented therein. The blood of Christ is the most precious thing in the world. When men shall account this holy blood of the New Testament, to be but an unholy thing and to trample it underfoot, God will not bear with this. The last thing to know mortification by is an actual abstinence from every sin. It is one thing to dislike a sin, and another thing to be weary of it, and to hate the sinfulness of it. 
If mortification be true, he will hate all kind of uncleanness with an inveterate hatred, be it of what degree it will. Sheep do hate all kinds of wolves. If a man do truly mortify and so on, his hatred to sin will be general, not only in abstinence from gross sins, as murder, adultery, and fornication, but also from all other sins. For when a man forsakes sin out of a hatred, his rancor is of judgment more than of passion, and so likewise his hatred will be constant. Men will be angry with their sins sometimes and fall out with them at other times and yet be friends again. But if they truly hate sin, their abstinence from sin will be constant. When a man becomes a new creature, there will arise a contrariety to sin in his nature, so that if a man hates sin, he is truly said to mortify it.